Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Friday Show. For those of you that are new here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I put out videos talking about the news, world events. And then we get to the Friday Show and I really focus on what this is all about and that is having a conversation. So here I go through the past week of videos, I look at the comments and I reply, I have a conversation. But before we get into that, I, I did want to cover something that a lot of people asked me to talk about. It didn't really fit into any of the shows and now there's also an update. Some of you might remember a gentleman by the name of Tariq Nasheed. He describes himself as an anti-racism strategist, a constitution advocate, and you might remember him a few weeks ago we featured his tweet, FYI, just because they sprinkled a couple of black Bill Cosby accusers in with dozens of white ones doesn't negate the fact that it racism. I asked if it's exhausting being that stupid or if you get used to it. He responded, cue the white supremacists with multiple troll accounts making the usually goofball insults. So that was that until this week when Tariq went to Twitter and posted, when they put all the white female Bill Cosby rape accusers, oh I love those quotes, rape accusers on the cover of New York Mag, we knew this was just a white supremacist witch hunt. To which someone responded, Do you not see the black women on the cover? I mark them with a red X for you. This is sad for us, but interview the black women real. To which he responded, A couple of tokenized blacks thrown in does not negate the fact that this is a white supremacist witch hunt. If Tariq Nasheed is a real person and not a top level troll, I don't, I don't know what to do with myself. I then, because I hate people that manipulate the news to fit their narrative, jumped into the story, taking a screenshot of the full cover with the red X's and the cropped photo that Tariq posted to hide the black rape accusers and tweeted everyone is a white supremacist and if black women also accuse Cosby of rape they are tokens. Tariq you're being disgusting. To which Tariq responded now go make one of your corny race baiting videos with the meme if you get offended when someone mentions white supremacy then you are probably a white supremacist. Which I pointed out that he had cropped the black women out of his post to mislead and promote a white hate narrative. Then later when people called him out for cropping out those women he responded black women women are quote cropped out of a lot of things until white supremacists want to use them as tokens for their agenda. You're talking about women who are accusing a man of rape. He's calling these women tokens. He's dismissing them as people because they go against his narrative. I mean, how can you be surprised that women are scared to accuse their rapist? And that would have been where this ridiculous story ends, except he has to be a troll. He can't be a real life person. He promoted a post, I don't know if he wrote it, titled, Suspected White Supremacist Philip DeFranco Tries to Tokenize Black Women. And it's written on a site that is so shitty and the writing is so poor. It has to be him, right? But I mean, granted, he is verified and he has an audience, so there's probably other people that are this stupid. Anyway, I just had to share that because depending on where where people read about me this week, I'm a white supremacist, I'm a Trump lover, I'm all these things apparently. This because I'm trying to be a rational voice in an increasingly irrational world. But that said, let's jump into the Monday show. Monday we talked about the CNN staging fake news controversy, London Bridge attacks and Trump's response to the London Mail. On the CNN fake news controversy, William Shelton wrote, I was an army journalist. We moved ourselves to get the best shot of a story. Moving the subject is staging, manipulation, editorializing, and creating Creating the news. Attempting to improve coverage by repositioning yourself to give perspective or take advantage of the availability of light is called honest, responsible journalism. Mainstream media is full of gangrenous, politically affiliated biases, and oh my god, I want to start using the word gangrenous. So visceral. Yeah, like I said, I'm not entirely convinced that the protesters were fake protesters or that they were paid to do it. And whether it be CNN or anyone else, this feels like it goes against best practices. Especially when, once again, the CNN reporter Anderson says this. A poignant scene and a scene we should sit on just for you viewers uh, to understand exactly how people feel here. It sounds like she found the scene, positioned herself in front of the scene and wants to showcase it. And so that's why I think that doing it this way is incredibly wrong. But as far as if CNN and the BBC and everyone that filmed that, they set out to fake the news, I don't think that's the case. What I've realized in my life and doing this show for so long is there's a lot of times that we see something as evil and it just turns out to be just stupid and lazy. Jay McConnell writes, good shot sell. It's been that way for years now. It's nothing new and people are attracted to close up pictures and video. To me it seems like people just smell blood in the water and they're jumping on everything they can find to get a reaction or justify the things they already think. So the last thing you said, Jay, let's let's put the, the sentence on the screen. That is the fucking truth about most everyone in this world. This is the thing that we will all be guilty of from time to time to some people all the time. The thing I appreciate about our audience, and I'm gonna say the majority of the audience, is in certain videos where I call out Trump for doing something incredibly fucking stupid, 
There are Trump supporters that are like, I'm a Trump supporter, but that is fucking stupid. The people that don't see their guy as infallible, the people that don't see their way as the only way. When I look to people that identify themselves as liberals and then they see stories like the Evergreen College story and they're like, those people are fucking crazy. Harassment, boxing in, just screaming in people's faces, that's not how you promote equality. So that's what I say more and more. We may not see eye to eye. There may be days that we're just like, fuck you. But more and more I'm seeing people not locked in. And that's important. As far as the other part of your comment, I, I get what you're saying. It still rubs me the wrong way. I'm more with William Shelton. I, I want more responsible journalism. More, if anything, raw views into the world. Doesn't have to be perfect. Texture over polish because texture is reality. Vaughn YouTube wrote, I don't know. Seems clear Trump did not take the comments out of context. No reason to be alarmed? What the fuck? How the hell are a bunch of police going to stop a single crazed individual from driving over a bunch of people, including those extra police? Be alarmed already. Crazy people do not obey any rational rules. They do not see police or hear police. Well, Vaughn, I would still say I do believe he took those those comments out of context. We, we played the full clip that he was grabbing it from. He's obviously saying don't freak out by the increase police presence, they're there for your protection. Also, and I want to go a little bit further here, and this is more of a, a personal opinion on how you handle yourself, and it's not PC culture versus something else. I don't believe that responsible leaders say, freak the fuck out, people! This shit's horrifying, I don't even want to go outside. The mayor of London, you can go after him for everything he's done outside of this situation till you're blue in the face, but what we're talking about is this situation. He said, we're taking the situation seriously, they're increasing police presence, we saw in the news that they were arresting people left and right. It's a misrepresentation of what the mayor said here. And as far as your notion of crazy people don't care about police, no. And also people that have a belief that there is a life beyond this one and that part of what they're doing in their head, that killing in this instance, it is going to serve them in the afterlife. That is horrifying. But the world in general is scary. There are soft targets everywhere. And there is terrorism of all kinds and all colors in this world. Uh, people are so scared that someone's going to try and put a bomb on an airplane when the, the really scary thing is that someone could just take a gun and mow people down while they're waiting in line to get screened to get on an airplane. You go into a mall, you're waiting outside of an amusement park. There is no such thing as a safe place. Things need to get done, precautions need to be made, we need to be more proactive than reactive, but telling people, ah, freak out! There are ramifications when people promote fear and anger. But that's also just my takeaway from this. And then let's talk about the Tuesday show. Tuesday we talked about the ever-developing YouTube demonetization problem, net neutrality protests, war machine being sentenced to 36 years in prison, and all the craziness happening with Qatar. Tim McClure wrote, I gave you a thumbs up, but I have to take exception with net neutrality. I just can't get behind the idea that government regulation keeps private businesses honest, especially when bureaucrats and politicians sell their souls to big business and special interest group at the drop of a hat. Consumers are far better at regulating, not to mention regulation already limits ISPs to begin with. Most cable companies who provide internet services have a geographic monopoly because of regulation. That's why you have virtually no competition among cable TV companies. And to that, I say, Hey, Tim, I think you just argued against your own point. I mean, I get what you're saying. The government is big, it is fat, at times it's very, very stupid. Regulations can get in the way of progress. I get that, and I get that consumers are great regulators on industries. If someone does something stupid, they stay away from that, they go to the good thing. But as you pointed out, in the United States, we have a really messed up system where companies essentially do have monopolies or duopolies. Where based on your location, maybe you have access to one, two, oh my god, three decent internet connections. Now, if the first move was to get rid of the bullshit that locked us into this horrible, horrible internet situation in the United States, then yes, I think that there is a conversation about taking away regulation and maybe not considering internet access as a utility, even though I personally believe that it is. So I guess the question I would ask is, since it doesn't appear that Congress is going to do anything about the original shitty situation, shouldn't we have the protections out there for us? The regular Joes, the entrepreneurs, the small businesses, why should they be able to live or die based on the choice of an ISP? On the topic of YouTube demonetizing some while not others, Northern Perspective wrote, in the two minutes of CNN coverage I watched, they play the video of one of the victims literally bleeding on the floor of a pub he took refuge in. I found that almost as disgusting and disturbing as a Subaru ad that cut the footage short because CNN can't properly space their ad segments. Alice A. Bayes wrote, I find it concerning that simply referencing there was a stabbing is deemed not ad friendly because if it means that less people will see it, it's essentially censoring reality and portraying the world as only a happy place with no problems that need fixing. I don't mean to be extreme, but I feel that balanced presentation of the news is vital in these times. So the Northern perspective, I say, yeah, that's what's confusing. It seems like some, but not all. But to Alice, I would say, that I think that there are things that it makes sense for there not to be ads next to. But as far as it being because of a description of an event that took place, which is news coverage, that, that feels a little wonky. From a business point of view, when I think about it from the brand's eyes, I get it. I understand that YouTube's policies are open enough to allow kind of a gray area of picking and choosing, but I personally just hate seeing the massive difference between the things that I say being demonetized and the things being said and shown 
uh, from other established organizations not being hit. That said, the whole situation got even more confusing because the video was demonetized, then we appealed it, then I was told, oh, well, no, it's going to stay demonetized, but then I also got an email that said, hey, your video has been monetized, but then I went back to YouTube and I still have that stupid yellow dot. I don't, I don't think they know what's happening. Whatever, I got you guys watching and sharing my videos to get it out there to the world. I got the DeFranco elite helping funding, filling in the holes of YouTube being wishy-washy about, well, you know, where the ads can go. So I'll leave that there, onward and upward. And then we had the Wednesday show. Wednesday, we talked about the horrible coverage from The Verge and Forbes.com. The I'm going to try and sell my husband into sex slavery Florida woman story. The drug epidemic currently happening in the United States the Senate intelligence hearings, and the opening statement from James Comey. On the misrepresentation story, Max Maggio wrote, I don't think the problem are the websites, but rather some of the people who write articles on those sites. Forbes probably gets thousands of articles a day, so they probably approve it after skim reading it. Well, so to that, that would ultimately then fall on the shoulders of the main editor-in-chief. And if you've gotten to the point where the editor-in-chief is just skimming through things, then your, your whole business model is gonna have a problem. And as far as the people, not the sites, I think that people should keep that in mind with any organization, whether it be what I build, I mean, we're gonna incorporate a lot of different people. Not everyone is going to get everything right all the time. And as you grow, the likelihood of shitty people being a part of your organization or people that have bias or people that they see getting more clicks as a better thing than proper representation, it happens. And as far as the Forbes article, I saw someone else that was written about it making a whole video on how they were misrepresented. Essentially saying he did this long, long interview with the writer of that article and he just took three things, spliced it up, and threw it in to make it look like garbage. And I'll say this is where my bias kicks in and I, I believe that because that has happened to me multiple times in the past and it is infuriating. You'll find writers that are just trying to pick apart what they're saying to fit a piece that they already want to throw out there. And making content like that, it's just, it's a garbage move. On drug deaths in the US, Tim McClure wrote, all the more reason to stop the war on drugs and decriminalize it. If we legalize drugs, we can control quality and distribution. If taxed, 100% of the money could go towards treatment. And I will say, when I was younger, I used to think that decriminalization of all drugs, that that was a crazy idea. Obviously the drug epidemic would get worse, but I actually don't, I don't think so. I'm not always a big fan when you compare other countries to the United States because it's not always apples to apples. Different population size, different breakdowns, it's just, it's often different situations. But you have examples of countries that have decriminalized drugs, that they focus on education, treatment, and they're doing fine. If people are going to get and do drugs, they are going to get and do drugs. Especially when it gets to the hard stuff. Like, it still, it boggles my mind that anyone ever will do meth. I mean, with just so much documentation of how scary that shit is. But yeah, I agree with you. I think if we stopped focusing on trying to incarcerate people who are doing drugs, putting people in prison for nonviolent crimes. There is so much money wasted and the, the number of lives and families ruined because of the war on drugs, it is, it is truly horrifying. And instead, we could spend the money on the proper education of young people of uh, how scary these drugs are. And I, and I mean like in a real thing. Not that marijuana is the devil, it's pretty much just as bad as heroin bullshit a lot of us got as kids, but just honest information. And then also throw money at treatment because people are going to become addicted. We talked about scary stats about legally prescribed opioids yesterday. Stats that were saying that there was a likelihood of one in four people abusing slash potentially becoming addicted to that medication. So you're giving people treatment for what they were getting legally. Also you help treat people for what they were doing illegally. And actually on the note of illegal drugs, specifically heroin, I, I got so many messages yesterday and there were several stories of, and I never really thought of this. And so many people were sharing their stories of how they or the, a friend or a family member, they actually became addicted to opioids, but then their prescriptions were ending and then they just went to heroin. And that was kind of eye-opening because I've always been a person that was like, how does someone get into heroin? Who? Who or who wakes up and they're like, meth sounds great. I don't know, but seeing those numbers, that was, that was, that's scary. And then let's talk about Thursday. Thursday, we talked about the police assaulting that guy on camera, the Ryanair harassment, the racist Chinese food incidents, and Comey, Comey, Comey. On the assault crash victim, Enten wrote, I don't think the police officers meant to beat up that innocent guy. They might've assumed he was the criminal driver somehow. I just think there's some reason for this to happen, but that still doesn't make it right. Let's even say that it was this driver. We, I think, as a society need to decide, well, I mean, not even we as a society, there are laws. Well, let's say morally, we as a society need to decide what we want police to be. Do we want them to be above the law? If this was the, the driver that was running away, I mean, he is, he is no longer a threat. He just stopped, dropped, and rolled, put himself out of fire, took his shirt off, hands down, no longer a threat, and it's beat down time. Are we saying that as a society we go, yeah, this is what we call asshole tax, or is that just justifying bad guys being bad guys to bad guys? On the Comey hearing, Peter Click wrote, no big win for either side. Comey said nothing that really shed more light on the Trump 
investigation, only giving his opinion about things we already knew. He may have leads, but nothing classified or that might get him in trouble. And what Loretta Lynch did may have been slimy, but it wasn't consequential. In the end, the only true loser was John McCain. What was John McCain saying? I love the pictures that people posted of the other senators just like, John, shut the fuck up. What are you, what? He was babbling, he seemed angry, he was all over the place. When it was all done, senators, including Rubio, were saying they, they couldn't follow his line of questioning. And in response to the general confusion from everyone, John, John McCain released this statement saying, I get the sense from Twitter that my line of questioning today went over people's heads. Maybe going forward, I shouldn't stay up late watching the Diamondbacks night games. Okay, so the first thing, Senator McCain, those two sentences do not go together. The first one is my question went over people's heads. So it was a very heady question, smart question. Your second sentence makes it sound like you didn't get that much sleep, so you're a little bit loopy, you were, you were off your game. So bad questions, confusing questions. These are not the same. Mr. McCain, do you realize that these are not the same? Also, I stayed up late watching Diamondbacks games? It was the night before what people were calling the political Super Bowl, which is not accurate. That would be the presidential election. But it's a big deal and you you have a very important role. You're the anchor. And John McCain was like, fuck it, foam finger, go backs. I mean this in the nicest way possible, but those sentences, I, I can smell them from over here. But all that said, it is still going to be interesting to see what the further fallout from this, this Comey hearing and the Trump response, what all of this is going to be. And that's actually where I'm gonna end today's show. And I just wanna thank you guys for another fantastic week. Thank you so much for being a part of this grand experiment, whether you just watch, whether you comment, whether you share, whether you're part of DeFranco Elite and you're helping fund this. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss these daily videos. Also, if you want to watch the full Philip DeFranco shows, you can click or tap right there. If you want to see the Friday vlog, which I, I talk about what we're doing next, click or tap right there. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you Monday.